In this video, we find the arc length of a polar curve, or the arc length, I guess I should say, the arc length of um, the graph of a polar equation. I don't know why I said polar curve. Um, we're going to derive the formula, and then we'll do an example. So here's the idea. If we're in polar coordinates, x is given by r times cosine of theta. Oops. And y is given by r times sine of theta. Well, since that's true, I can replace r with, a, with whatever r is in terms of theta. and I can replace r with whatever r is in terms of theta here. And now I have x as a function of theta only and y as a function of theta only. I know it looks like that's r times theta, but it's not, that's function notation. I'm saying r is a function of theta. So I've got two functions of theta, but now I can think of theta as my parameter. Remember when we found um, arc length for parametric equations, we said, Take the integral from a to b of the square root of x prime squared plus y prime squared dt. But now instead of our variable, um, our parameter being um, t, we can use the parameter theta instead. So this is just x prime of theta, y prime of theta, d theta, and we'll integrate from some value of theta to some other value of theta. Now, this is the right integral, um, but it simplifies. It simplifies significantly. Um, and remember, let's just review briefly what it is we're trying to find. Let's say we've got a curve that looks like this. And at theta equals alpha, we're here. And at theta equals beta, we're over here. We're just trying to find the length of that curve. If I had a piece of string lying on that curve and then I stretched it out and I measured it, I want to know how long that curve would be after I stretched it out and measured it. And this is given by um, r as a function of theta. <coughs> well, this is the right integral, but it simplifies significantly because x is equal to r times cosine of theta and y is equal to r times sine of theta. You can imagine that when I take derivatives and I square them, and add them and then take the square root. We're gonna have some sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. We're gonna have a lot of things that simplify really nicely. So even though this is right, we're going to come up with a different integral, which is even simpler than this to evaluate. And that integral will involve r of theta instead of x of theta and y of theta. Okay, so in order to do that, I want to simplify this integrand first. And in order to do that, the first thing we need to do is compute x prime and y prime. As functions of theta. Now, since r depends on theta, I am, well, actually, I think I will leave that dependence on theta there. x prime is the derivative with respect to theta of r of theta times cosine of theta. This requires the product rule. So we'll have, this is our first function and that is our second function. According to the product rule we get, derivative of the first times the second plus derivative of the second, which is negative sine of theta times the first, which is r of theta. And actually, let's compute not just x prime and y prime. Let's compute x prime squared and y prime squared. So now I want to take x prime and I want to square it. Because we're going to add those together and take the square root in a little bit. So this is r prime of theta plus or times cosine minus r of theta times sine squared. 
So I've got to write that twice in FOIL. It's just a binomial squared. We want to think of it that way. Just written that twice. And first times first, I'm going to have r prime times r prime. I'll keep writing a, a vector. It's not a vector, I'm not in Calc 3. It's r prime of theta. And then I've got cosine times cosine. That's cosine squared theta. And outer times outer is minus r of theta times r prime of theta times sine times cosine. <laughs> I keep doing that. And because these were the same thing, inner times inner is exactly like it. So I'll have two of those. And then last times last is r of theta and r of theta multiplying each other. So that's r of theta squared. And sine times sine is sine squared. Okay, so I get that for my x prime or x prime squared. Now we want to do the same thing with y prime squared. So first let's compute y prime. So we're taking the derivative with respect to theta of r times sine of theta. This is a function of theta times a function of theta. It requires a product rule. That's our first function and that's our second. So we're going to have derivative of the second <laughs> or derivative of the first, excuse me, times the second plus derivative of the second times the first. And then I want to take that and square it. So I've got that and that, and I'm squaring it, so I just write it twice. I think I am going to drop that dependence on theta just for a little bit. Don't forget that r is a function of theta though. So first times first is going to give me r prime squared and sine times sine is sine squared. And then outer times outer is plus r times r prime times sine of theta times cosine of theta. Inner times inner is the same, so we've got two of those. And last times last is r squared cosine squared theta. Okay, now I'm adding this to this because this is x prime squared and this is y prime squared. Notice what we get. Here's r prime squared cosine squared and here's r prime squared times sine squared. If I add those together and I factor out the r prime squared, I get r prime squared times cosine squared plus sine squared. And isn't that nice? Trig identity, that's gone, that's one. And I'm adding these together still. So this plus this, well, those are exactly the same, but with opposite signs. So those are going to reduce. And then I've got this piece and this piece. So now I'm focusing on, oops. the r squared sine squared and the r squared cosine squared. I can factor out r squared from both of those, from both of those, excuse me. And then I'm left with sine squared plus cosine squared. And that's one. So we just end up with r prime squared plus r squared. Isn't that nice? So instead of writing an x prime squared plus y prime squared every time and having to do all of this algebra for a, a, a particular r prime and a particular r, we can skip. This always happens. We always have this sine squared plus cosine squared and this sine squared plus cosine squared. So that expression under the radical is really r prime squared plus r squared. So our arc length can be written this way. It's the integral from alpha to beta of the square root of 
r prime squared, this is r prime of theta squared, plus r of theta squared. And there are always conditions, aren't there? Under some conditions, we can use this. This is given that r prime is continuous. on the interval from alpha to beta. And the curve has to be traced out once and only once. Given that this is continuous and that the curve is traced out once. If this were a circle, we went from zero to four pi circle centered at the origin, we'd get twice the length. We want to make sure we only to get one time, one times the length if we're asking for our claim. Okay. So in practice, this is pretty simple. You just compute R prime, you, you substitute R, you simplify this, and then you evaluate the integral. But that's where that comes from. It comes from thinking of these as parametric equations, um, giving me X as a function of theta and Y as a function of theta and then substituting there and simplifying. They all simplify if x and y um, are r cosine theta and r sine theta, where r is a given function of theta. It all simplifies to this. OK, so let's find the length of the graph of the polar equation. So let's say you're given r equals 8 times the quantity 1 plus cosine of theta, and you're told that theta ranges from 0 to pi over 3, and you want to graph this. <coughs> well, we can graph it, or not graph it, excuse me, we want the length of the curve. Well, we can find the length. It's given by this. Oops. So we'll have r of theta squared here, and then r prime of theta squared over here. I already substituted in my r of theta, sorry. Got a little ahead of myself. And then we'll just simplify, and we'll evaluate that. Now, if we want to, we could also graph this curve on the interval from 0 to pi over 3 to get a better sense of what the curve looks like. Um, but I think I'm going to skip that this time. We've graphed a lot of curves in the last few videos. So let's say that r is 8 times this quantity. Let's distribute the 8 and compute r prime. Derivative of 8 is 0. Derivative of 8 times cosine of theta is 8 times negative sine of theta. So we get negative 8 times sine of theta. And we substitute that in right here. OK. So now let's square this and square this and hope we get some simplifications. And we usually do, because you've got the cosine there and the sine there. So if I square this, I've got two factors. So I square the 8 and I square the quantity um, 1 plus cosine of theta. And then over here, I square the 8, and I square sine, the sine of theta. So I've got 64. I'm just focused on that expression under the radical. This is 64 times, when I write this twice in FOIL, I'll get 1 plus 2 cosine of theta plus cosine squared theta. And I factor it out. The 64, over here I've got a sine squared theta. Sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. Okay. So I've got 64 times 2 plus 2 cosine of theta. Let's factor out the 2. 
Now this is not the expression, or this is the expression under the radical, it's not our integrand. So our integrand is actually this. Ooh. So we've got s equals the integral from zero to pi over three of the square root of 128, which is eight times the square root of two times the square root of one plus cosine of theta. And we're integrating with respect to theta, but I notice a u sub won't work for that because I don't have a sign out here. So I'm gonna go back to that very first chapter we studied. I see something that, like that and I'm saying to myself, well, how can I evaluate that integral? Well, it involves a one my, a plus cosine of theta. Maybe multiplying by the conjugate will work. Since this is under the square root, a square root, its conjugate should probably be under a square root as well, so everything simplifies nicely. If that's a plus b, its conjugate is a minus b. Now we can't just multiply that by the conjugate, we have to multiply the numerator and denominator by the conjugate um, in order for this to work out. So um, we multiply by this and our hope is, after simplification, this will be an integral we can evaluate. So let's write that as itself over one and factor out the eight root two. And in the numerator, you'll have the square root of this times this. Square root of a times the square root of b is the square root of a times b. So you just multiply the one plus cosine by the one minus cosine. First times first is one, outer times outer is negative cosine, inner times inner is positive cosine. So those reduce. Last times last is cosine squared. That always happens with conjugates, so you end up with a squared minus b squared, all over the square root of one minus cosine of theta. Ooh, we have a little bit of a problem there, don't we? Um, at theta equals zero, I would be dividing by zero. So this is actually an improper integral. Hmm, that's okay. Um, one minus cosine squared is sine squared, so that's the square root of sine squared. And that is just sine of theta, as long as sine is positive. Let's look at sine. Sine looks like this. Oh, it's fine on the interval from zero to pi over three, we're gonna be just fine. That'll be positive value, because all the y values are positive on that sine graph on that interval. So we can make that a sine of theta. Now this is an improper integral, because at zero, cosine is one. So I'd have um, the square root of one minus zero, or excuse me, one minus one, which would be the square root of zero. So this would be undefined at um, theta equals zero. Like that's okay, we can, we can get around this. We'll just call it a limit. So I've got eight times the square root of two times the limit as a approaches zero from the right of the integral from a to pi over three of this. And this is good coming up right before finals. We needed to practice improper integrals before finals anyway. This is a good opportunity to practice. Okay, so then I just, after I write my improper integral as a limit, I look at this and I say, how do I evaluate that proper integral? Well, I can use a u sub. This one, I could not evaluate, but when I multiply by the conjugate and simplify, this can be evaluated with u sub. So we'll let u equal a uh, one minus uh, cosine of theta. Du is the derivative of that with respect to theta. Derivative of negative cosine is positive sine. Okay, so we end up with a square root of u in the denominator and a du up here. 
So I'll bring that square root of u up to the numerator. I get that. Now I need new bounds. The new lower bound is one minus cosine of a. The new upper bound is one minus cosine of pi over three or cosine of 60 degrees. And 60 degrees, if I draw a right triangle, special right triangle, one, two, square root of three, cosine is one half. So this is one minus one half, which is one half. So my new upper bound for you is one half and my lower bound is one minus cosine of A. Okay, now let's anti-differentiate with respect to U. So we add one to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. Dividing by one half is the same as multiplying by two. And we evaluate this at the upper bound and the lower bound and we subtract. And then we take the limit of the result as A approaches zero from the right. So we end up with eight root two times two times the square root of one half minus two times the square root of one minus cosine of a. Oops, I forgot my limit notation. Still taking the limit of that as a approaches zero from the right. That's just a constant. It's a square root of two in the denominator. Two divided by root two is root two. And as a approaches zero from the right, cosine of a approaches one. So this is just approaching zero, and we get eight root two times root two, which is 16. The length of the curve is 16. You're saying what curve? It's the curve given by this function on the interval from zero to pi over three. Um, we could graph the curve um, if we picked some values of theta between zero and pi over three. Um, but I don't think I'm going to, not this time. But the length of that curve is just 16. And again, the way we evaluated it was we evaluated this expression. They gave us theta equals zero and theta equals pi over three. We substitute in, substituted in r prime and r of theta. We have this and this right here. And then we simplified and we got this. And we said, look at that integrand. Um, can't evaluate that integral as it stands, but if I multiply by the conjugate, I can do a u sub. And then we said, uh-oh, because of the conjugate, now I'm dividing by zero. So it's an improper integral. We evaluate that integral. And eventually we got our length of 16. So that right there is how you find the length of a curve given by r equals r of theta, given that r prime of theta is continuous on the interval from a to b, or alpha to beta, and that the curve is traced out only once on that interval. And we made some assumptions when we did our example. We assumed that the curve was traced out only once. Um, and our function r of theta, or excuse me, r prime of theta, that's that, that's clearly continuous on the interval from alpha to beta. And alpha was zero and uh, beta was pi over three. So that's continuous there. 